Hey there folks, so I've got a, uh, another new backlight kit for the Game Boy Color here today. Uh, this kit was provided to me by Retro Game Repair Shop to check out, and uh, well, let's, let's see what we got. Uh, so my understanding is that most of the uh, like generic or unbranded kits end up getting shipped in one of these nice hard boxes, uh, but then again I did also order several things and more stuff for later. Um, Pretty nice boxes. You can jam a Game Boy in here when you're done. Works out nicely. Anywho, uh, this is the kit that we've got. So we've got the uh, screen lens. We got a whole crap ton of wire. Did I mention that soldering is required for this specific kit? Uh, it does come with this adapter, which is a micro HDMI, don't quote me on that, uh, to a full-size HDMI. I'm going to go ahead and set this aside for now, because we won't need it until the very end of the video, but I'm going to go ahead and click that onto my HDMI cable anyhow. Alright, so we have the uh, actual converter board. It looks like it's already hooked up to the LCD in my case. I don't know if that's pretty typical or not, uh, but this is the same uh, Q5 LCD that we've seen on quite a few of these kits at this point. And set that out. Got some insulation film. Two things of it. Got this uh, gasket to attach the uh, LCD to the shell. Uh, don't use this if you ever want to remove the LCD from the screen. This stuff is usually more or less permanent. Um, whole ton of wire, like I mentioned before. And a little ribbon cable adapter to connect the converter board to the Game Boy Color itself. Uh, so there's quite a bit going on with this kit, but uh, install should be relatively straightforward. Uh, it's going to be pretty similar to a lot of the previous kits that I've shown off before, especially the Q5 ones, uh, but there is going to be a little bit more soldering that we have to do on account of um, this thing using an OSD uh, or an on-screen display to control some of the settings. Uh, soldering for the OSD is not required to use this thing and nearly all of its features um, to like line up to to, to adjust the screen alignment in the shell if you don't get it perfectly centered or something like that, you will need the OSD. Uh, but it should automatically switch to HDMI output when you plug in the uh, HDMI cable. Um, additionally, there are these touch pads if you want to use them for... I know one of them is for brightness. I believe the other one is for pa adjusting palettes, color palettes and such. Uh, and there might be a function combining the two if you hit both of them at the same time or press and hold or something we'll we'll check it out in a bit uh and the screen lens before moving on before getting totally distracted i do want to quickly bring up one thing you might notice that this thing has a pure white logo there's no uh there's no like game boy color styling or anything on that um unlike their older kits which did have the proper logo uh but you might also notice that this is not laminated, unlike their older kits, which I also have here. Uh, if you want to, you can absolutely use the older laminated screen with this kit, uh, especially if you've already got a build and it's working pretty nicely. One caveat is that one of the new features with this kit is um, something they've imitated from Funny Playing in that they've uh, added illumination behind the logo to make it light up. This kit supports that, this screen does not. So, if you were to use this screen with this kit, you would not have a light light up logo. Everything else would work just fine though. Uh, there is also the other option of um, tracking down a funny playing laminated screen if you wanna go with one of those. Those should work as well and the, lam or the um, illuminated logo should also work. We'll try that out, which on that note, the uh, Funny Playing Game Boy Color shells only accept Funny Playing LCDs. Uh, if you use, if you're using one of the Funny Playing Game Boy Color shells, you can 
tell them pretty easily by this ginormous shelf on the back of the screen. Um, if you're using one of these funny playing shelves, they don't quite fit the older style uh, one chip, quote unquote, laminated screen assemblies. You can tell the difference between one chip and funny playing just based off of how close the lens is to the LCD. Uh, but because there is such a large amount of material between the lens and the LCD, the screens don't actually fit quite right. Um, so if for some reason you have one of them laminated screens you want to use and you're looking at these funny playing shells, do keep in mind that some modification will be required. I am fairly confident that just cutting out this shelf in the back will allow me to fit this in. Uh, but if we're doing some screen cutting anyway, there's a different setup I want to do. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into that momentarily. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on here. Let's set this aside. Pretty sure that's a good LCD. And this one certainly should be. And I'll just put that wire over there. Okay. So tonight's donor is a perfectly working Game Boy Color that I just grabbed in a um, junk auction because of who I am as a person. Uh, and I did already fix it. You'll have to forgive me. I didn't show that on screen. Uh, but I did make a uh, YouTube short on that. Realistically, most of the time, like all these things have wrong with them is they just need a power switch cleaning. Uh, I'll have more information on that linked in the description if you want to check it out. But we do got to start off with a working Game Boy because if for some reason it doesn't work when we put it all together, this simplifies troubleshooting quite significantly because if I know the Game Boy works when I put it together, then clearly something must have changed while I was uh, doing the work. Whereas if it didn't work beforehand, well, it's probably not going to work afterwards either. Let's go ahead and get this torn down. I do already have one screw out because I already fixed it and I just forgot to put that screw in. <laughs> okay. Once I've got the back off here, uh, if you're reshelling the Game Boy, this is probably the last time you'll use this. But if not, go ahead and hang on to this because you can always slip on just the back to the bare motherboard and use the battery compartment to power it for testing. Uh, but let us go ahead and I'm going to get the power supply here. Because we want to see what kind of power usage this kit draws, but to have any context for that number, we will have to see what a stock Game Boy Color looks like. And every Game Boy is a little bit different, so. I'll turn that on, it's set to 2.4 volts. Boot that up, exact same game I always use for testing. I'm trying to angle that so you can actually see it. Screens in original Game Boys didn't have any internal lighting, so they're kind of hard to see, and this one in particular has a bad polarizer, so it's even harder to see. You can tell based off of the uh, colors, it's, it's easier to see around the periphery than it is in the center, but it is what it is, or vice versa, excuse me. Uh, anyway, at 2.4 volts, in the overworld, same place I always test, same game I always test, it is pulling anywhere from 80 to 87 milliamps, uh, 77 to 87 milliamps, which is actually a little bit lower than uh, typical, but close enough that I have new concerns. I can't even speak. Close enough that I have zero concerns. Let's kill that and continue with the install. So like I mentioned before, soldering is required for this kit. Uh, I believe soldering is 
required just for testing, but we'll find out in just a second, won't we? I need... Just clean it off. It's quite dusty. That is one of the unfortunate side effects of Game Boy models um, from before the Game Boy Advance SP. None of them had um, speaker grills, uh, like the, the cloth barrier. So any dust that this thing is exposed to is going to go straight through the speaker grill and land on the speaker. And it's Anyway. Plug that in on the Game Boy side, it goes contacts up, and then we will plug this in here. On the adapter side, I believe it goes contacts down, and then let's try it out. And so here's, here's what I meant, you can drop it into the rear shell and then just insert your batteries and try it out that way. I'm going to use my power supply because... I have a power supply, but it's not explicitly required for testing something like this. It is useful for troubleshooting, but anywho, I don't think this works without soldering, so let's try it out. Yeah, nothing. Nothing on the screen, but the Game Boy is on. So let us start soldering. And I am going to go ahead and detach that LCD for the time being. Come back to it. And let's see here. Are these all the same length? They look to be, except for one. I don't know what this short one is for. But it's technically not going to reach what I want it to reach. That's okay. So we need to solder for testing to the bat terminal, which is right on top here. Oh, actually, I think this short wire might be for that. Ah, oh, it's so, it's just barely not long enough, though. Anyway, I'm going to come down. I am going to trim this, but. going to be okay. Oh, it helps if I have my wire strippers, don't I? Oh, there it is. I have the wrong size in there, that's why it's not working. I doubt this one's gonna work either. Yep. Because this is 34 gauge wire. And my strippers only go down to 32. It's not a PVC coating either. 
Well, shoot. Alright, so maybe don't uh, trim the wires unless you actually have the tools to deal with that. Which I don't right now, and I don't know what I did with the extra tips for that thing. Oh, it doesn't matter. I don't have tips that go that small. Alright, hang on. I'll be right back while I figure this out. Alright. Stripped, got it tinned. I'm gonna trim that lead because it's still a little bit too long. And then we need to solder this to, I believe it is the common pin. Let's double check the uh, instructions, why don't we? Yep, it's small, but it's in there if you check the listing. So on the power switch there are four pins, one, C, two, and three. We want to solder this wire to the pin labeled C. Get that terminal nice and tinned. I'm coming back with the wire. Hmm, I always do this and I always regret it. This is not a good tip for soldering to these power switch wires. But now my iron is hot and switching it is quite a bit of hassle too. and solid and let's try it out again routing could be better but once this thing is folded up it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty tidy anyhow game in there too. Let me get some tests going. And let's see what we got. Nope. Uh-oh. Well, nothing. That's awkward. Oh, there it goes. So in the overworld, at the exact same place, 2.4 volts. At the minimum brightness, uh, this thing is pulling 234 to 242 milliamps. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 11 levels of brightness. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And a max brightness. This thing is pulling 304 to 313 milliamps.
which is surprisingly not bad. If we press and hold the brightness sensor, it appears to toggle the uh, battery, uh, the little battery icon. Um, I don't know if that's calibrated for alkaline, nickel metal hydride, or lithium ion, but judging by the fact that I have it set to 2.4 volts and it's showing pretty much dead, I'm gonna bet that that is calibrated for lithium ion. And we can actually try that, or verify that. By bumping that up to 3.4 volts, but I accidentally went the wrong way, so it stopped. And now it's showing full, so that shows to me that this is probably set to alkaline. Oop. 2.8, now it's showing halfway depleted. So yeah, I'd say this is calibrated for alkaline. That might be a setting that we can change in the menu. It'll be interesting to find out. Hold that and that should go away. And then if we hold the palette sensor, it should toggle the uh, pixel grid modes, which indeed it does. We have, what is that, the third mode? And then off. One, two, three, I usually like to leave it off, but it is what it is. Can't tell that without taking the paper off. All right, so I think we're pretty good to go to uh, do the next install, or the next step. Try touching both at the same time and see if it does anything. <laughs> well, it did something. <laughs> I don't know that it's supposed to do that. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if holding both of those does a factory reset or something. That is an interesting feature. Um, I like it, but it's still interesting. Um, let's power that off. And let's try out, before moving on, the other two types of Q5 display. Once we get the OSD wired up, I believe there's even more options for us to configure or to mess with, uh, such as the um, logo illumination there. So, yeah, that works fine. One problem that I didn't notice when I initially was messing with these laminated screens I didn't even realize that the uh, screen was laminated crooked. Oops. Oh well. Uh, well, if you're using one of these, hopefully that doesn't happen to you. Um, I had two of these. Maybe this is the only laminated one, or the only crooked one. It's on there pretty solid, so I don't think that's moving. But no logo illumination. And one more. Slip that out. Try out the funny playing. Now, full disclosure, this screen came out of my pile of broken screens, so it's entirely possible that it has a defect. Eh, but it still works anyhow. All right, so there, that's what, that's what I wanted to see. I want to make sure that the uh, logo lines up, and indeed it does. So if, for some reason, you have one of these screens, uh, the uh, Funny Playing Laminated screen, you can use it with this kit. Everything lines up close enough. Uh, and if you've got one of these screens, it also means you can use one of these shelves. I'm not gonna be using this screen, even though it would simplify the install quite significantly, but, we will go ahead and move on.
Alright. Kill that. Now that we know everything works, I can continue with the rest of the soldering. So unfortunately, we can't really test HDMI out until we do some of the soldering. Or at least, if we test HDMI, there won't be any audio. So just, just something to keep in mind. I guess I'm also going to leave these wires pretty long because stripping them is kind of a pain in the butt. Because I don't have the right size wire strippers. Alright. And to solder, we need, for the OSD, we need wire 4B. A wire for A, a wire for select, And I don't believe we need that ground wire. And then for audio, we need a wire for L. Without this, we will have no audio over HDMI. And R. And the instructions say we do need that ground wire, but let's see. I'm going to get the multimeter here, which isn't where it's supposed to be, but I found it anyway. Put it in continuity mode. I've still got that ribbon connected. I can see that these two grounds are not connected with each other. Oh, yes they are. I just didn't have my probe in the right spot. So these two pads are connected internally within this console, or within this adapter board. The ground on the console itself is also connected through this ribbon. So we don't need it. Uh, I am going to go ahead and follow the instructions, however, in case there is something I don't know. Uh, because I can't imagine that they would give you extraneous steps that you don't need to do. Because, you know, they're shipping these kits with exactly as much wire as you need. I'm sure it'd be cheaper for them to only include actually exactly as much wire as you need. So if you don't need a ground, picking up what I'm putting down. All right. So next, we need to figure out what buttons we need to solder to. It is listed in the instructions, but it is also pretty easy to figure out with a multimeter in continuity mode. Uh, buttons work with a common ground approach, so one of the pads is going to be ground. The other is going to be attached to, for B specifically, this P11 touch test point. I don't like using that, especially because I'm going to be using a clear shell. So instead, I'm going to be using one of these vias right here, uh, which all of the buttons on the left-hand side get routed up to these vias right here, and then on the right-hand side to these vias right here, and then they all consolidate into this group of vias right here. Uh, so in this particular case, B is connected to, uh, if you look at the cart slot right above the WR pin, that's what B is connected to, or we can use in this cluster of four, the bottom right one. I'm going to go with the bottom right of that cluster of four. We will also need A, which is probably that top one in that cluster four, yep. And the right one right above the uh, not pin. I don't know what that actually is. It's a little circle with a line through it. 
uh, but it's to the right of B. But I'm going to use that one up there. And soldering to these can be a little bit difficult, but my preferred method is to just get a big old solder ball going on the iron and then just drag it over the vias until it sticks. Uh, I see a lot of people when they do this sort of soldering, they recommend using a little bit of um, abrasive, like a fiber fiberglass scratch pen on the vias to uh, you know get them started with the soldering. But in my experience, ooh, whoops. In my experience, we don't need that. Uh, once we get a little bit of solder inside that via itself, it'll stick and it'll go where it needs to go. The problem I'm running into is that this knife tip is just really not good for soldering these kind of joints and I insist on using it anyway. And luckily, bare solder is pretty forgiving. When you drip onto a board like that, just pick it off. That's just one of the habits of, or, habits, um, byproducts of soldering like that. That's not a very solid joint, is it? Let's try that again. There we go, nice and solid. And then what do we want to do? Select, I believe that also gets routed, we know select gets routed on the left, but then it crosses over to the right. So it's probably, in this cluster of vias on the left, it is the bottom one. And I, again, this is in the listing, uh, but I'll also link a document if you want to take a look at that. Direction. What am I missing? Should be one of these. Oh, there we go. There was just flux. So in that cluster of four vias, it is the bottom left. Which is convenient, because that's where all my other wires already are. And nice and solid. All right, now we need to solder the audio wires. Uh, 
and we will be using the LN, RN, and then ground. Ground we can grab right from the cart slot header. Ooh. I keep getting dry joints, so I'm gonna put a little bit of flux. Much better. And then. R goes to R in. L goes to L in. And then we're pretty much done with the wiring. Which is unfortunately the easy part, but... But hey, one thing you can do is you can like tie this in a knot to pick up some of the extra slack. There should be plenty of space behind the uh, LCD to tuck this wiring in. Uh, I'm not gonna like actually tie it into a knot. I'm just gonna loop it around so that I can lay it flat. And that'll go down just like that. And there's all my extra wiring slack picked up. All right, so now we are moving on to modifying the shell, which in this particular case, I am using a shell that I've been meaning to use for a build, but that is gonna make my life a little bit difficult because this is designed for an OEM LCD. Um, Almost. This is actually a uh, brand new shell made by Cloud Game Store, and they do make their own backlight kits, so they're probably going to not be too happy if they find out I'm using their shell on <laughs> other backlight kits, but shh, you don't tell them, I won't tell them. Anyway, um, it's designed for OEM screens and their screens. So what that means is instead of having this little wall down here at the bottom where the screen would go, there's nothing there. Uh, so that's a little bit less that we uh, don't have to trim, which is convenient because it's not quite visible under the lens, but yeah, depending on how close, how far we stray, you know, it's pretty convenient. Anyway, uh, we do need to do quite a bit of trimming nonetheless. Let me grab the phone here. Here is what the trim looks like. So we need to cut out basically all of those walls surrounding the uh, LCD. So this whole wall here, mine does not have this bottom wall, so I'll be good to go. And then we need to enlarge the window quite a bit. And you can see that uh, we also are enlarging the bottom so that it makes sure, so that this illuminated logo does actually get illuminated. In my particular case, I'm probably going to be fine if I don't enlarge that because this is a, um, it's, well, it's a transparent shell. Uh, one problem I can foresee with not enlarging that, if I pop on the flashlight and hold that behind, you can see the uh, Game Boy Color logo does slightly overlap with the, uh, with the shell. So to get a consistent look, I'm going to want to trim that. And you know what? Might as well mark it out right now. Let me grab a Sharpie. And then I can come in here and give that a nice wide berth. I'm just going to trace the line on the adhesive for the shell. More or less. 
and by adhesive for the shell I mean the adhesive on the screen because the screen has this little cutout on the bottom there. And actually I'm going to do that all the way around. In this particular case it looks like we only need to trim on the top here. is one of the benefits to using a transparent shell. Uh, and then we just need to cut out these walls. The whole thing, I believe up to and including that recessed part, but I will double check that in just a second. and including some of that light cylinder guide, I don't know. That's um, where the LED goes. We need to cut out a little bit for the, um, for the width of the screen. It's, it's a very large screen. You can see it does not fit in between the periphery of those. But that should be it, more or less. Let's see what we got. Uh-oh. I went home by accident. Okay, there it is. Mm. Okay. So I had that right. We do need to trim some of this part, but not that whole top wall, which is convenient because that wall does show through the front of the shell. Uh, but I am actually going to be doing a lot of this off camera because I am going to be using power tools. Now, in this particular case for the wall, we could just come up here and you know snip, snip, snip with flush cutters the whole way around. Uh, but because this is a transparent shell, it's going to leave some white marks. I think that's going to be ugly. And quite frankly, I have power tools, so I'm going to use them. Uh, so I will be right back while I go get this trimmed. Uh, until, until then. All right, so I've got those walls trimmed down. It ain't perfect, but it's certainly good enough. The LCD should drop right in, and indeed it does. I'm always very pleased with how clean the cuts come out when I when I use that tool. It's just a, uh, I believe it's a four millimeter flat end mill bit that I have in my rotary tool that is in a stand. I can set the height and then lock it there and then just run this whole thing along the bottom of the tool. And I just put tape on the shell so that it slides easier and doesn't scratch. Uh, to do these last two trims, I want to take out some of the top and the bottom plastic in the viewing window. Uh, normally I would use the score and snap method, but in this particular case I've got a big old dirty bastard file that I'm going to use and I'm just literally going to file down the plastic until I hit those lines and uh, I'll be back once I'm done with that. I'm going to do that off screen because that makes even more dust than... Uh, the rotary tool does, and my desk is already a mess. It needs all the help it can get. Uh, but also, I don't want to breathe that, so it is what it is. I'll be back when that's done. All right, I think we're almost there. I just about finished filing. Uh, did quite a few fit checks, and I came back and saw that the... Uh, inner edges of both the left and right side were like right up against the uh, adhesive so I pulled them down a little bit too but we're there we're there okay so before continuing the install however there are still a few more steps that have to be addressed so if we drop this in here you can see it fits at a very, very specific height. Um, the PCB is shaped such that, let me flip this up here. You can see on the uh, left by the port where my pinky is, 
there's that little protrusion on the PCB that is designed to hook up and around the screw post so that when you when you have everything together and you go to plug a cable in it puts pressure on that screw post instead of like just pushing the board into the console but on that note uh, we also have to make a hole for the micro HDMI which is unfortunately gonna be gonna be kind of difficult because I can't get it lined up I'm gonna have to make like a jig or something let's see what the instructions show never mind because I don't know what I did with that phone never mind again I found it all right, so in here, oh, that's not very helpful, is it? It just shows that one picture where it's all filed out, and you can see even in the picture, they, they kind of miss the mark. Uh, so let us see. Let's see if I can do a better job of that. So realistically, I should have done all this fit checking before soldering this thing together, because now I can't really take it apart. But I'm thinking we can get the alignment close and then wing it and hope for the best. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. All right, so I'm going to get that as close as I can to where I think it needs to go. Then I'm gonna come in here with my tweezers and just make little score marks in the shell. So that when I set this down, come back, I can still see those score marks. And now I just need to uh, cut that down. Um, I'm wagering we just need to cut to the bottom of the port, which would mean just below the uh, the plastic here. I am going to whoop, try marking that once again. Except I marked it a little bit above because I'm gonna come back and uh, I'm gonna make it I'm gonna make my cut small and then try and fit this with the, with the file manually because I want that to be as tight as possible uh, and now this part I am going to once again swap over to the Dremel I'll be right back all right, so I went ahead and took a quick slot out of here with the uh, rotary tool and thankfully it is just barely too small so I'm gonna have to come back in here with the uh, the Dremel uh, unfortunately the uh, PCB itself appears to need to fit into that hole which is a bit of a shame but because otherwise it won't move up enough to uh, clear that screw post if you can see that but it looks like uh, it looks like I got almost everything so close though I need to go a little bit deeper so I am going to I'm just gonna do that on the rotary tool All right, so it's actually pretty cleverly positioned, all things considered. You can see the Game Boy Color motherboard just barely clears it, so that should provide uh, a significant amount of support just plugging the Jesus thing in. Uh, and now, let us check and see what kind of fit we got going here. For example, does this close? It does not. So, I'm thinking, it looks like we need to file down the back of the housing as well, 
And unfortunately, I'm going to have to do that one by hand because we want it to snug up. And I can file down more of the front shell, uh, but as you can see, the uh, converter board is already resting on one of those uh, uh, remnants for the screen, one of the screen supports. Uh, so this side can't go too much further into the shell that way, so we're going to need to cut that way. And my solution is going to be to mark this up again. Nice sharp tweezers. And then I will come in with the needle file and just knock down this wall to the uh, inner support there. And again, gonna do that off camera because lots of dust, I'm gonna do it over there. Um, I'll be right back again. All right, I've got it good enough. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot we can do about that uh, little inner board showing. Um, just gonna have to leave it as is, I guess. It'd be nice if the uh, PCB was spaced a little bit better so we only had to have the port sticking out, but whatever. It is what it is. I think we are finally, finally, good to go for reassembly. Um, but before that, I'm going to grab a knife here and just break the edges a little bit and get the... Uh, little flashing from the plastic off. Unfortunately, there is a lot of trimming for something like this. It's kind of insane. Worst part is that like all of these steps are cumulative. So if you mess up late in the stage, you have to do all of the early stages too. All right, I think we're there. I'm gonna put this away before I ruin the finish on my shell. <sighs> all that and I don't even have like buttons I want to use. I wanted to grab some retro retro CNC buttons and throw them in here, but unfortunately all I have are uh, pocket buttons, advance buttons, and uh, SP buttons, which don't quite work in a color. Uh, plan B was these blue buttons I had laying around, but I'm not sure I like that. So I think I'm just going to go with stock buttons for now and can revisit some other time. In this particular case, I am using the buttons that came with the shell, most of them. Oh wait, before we put the buttons in, I gotta put the screen in, don't I? So because the position of the uh, image on the screen is adjustable, through the OSD, we don't have to pay too much attention about like where specifically it goes as long as everything fits in there appropriately. Uh, but what we do have to pay attention to is making sure that the LCD is installed straight. So that is why we leave this little top, uh, this top wall here. You see I trimmed down both of the edges on the left and right, but I left the wall itself intact and I'm going to be using that to position the LCD because I want it uh, completely aligned with this wall. If it's crooked, we can't fix that in software. If it's misaligned, yeah, I can fix that. That's about it. All right. All right. That's kind of weird, but sure. Do I have that backwards or sideways? What's going on here? Ah, 
Ah, it looked like I had that sideways. Okay. So how this works is we peel this back off. Keep that center part in there. Because otherwise this thing becomes very, very difficult to handle. And we're gonna... that lined up as best we can get all the edges smooshed down and then once we've got the edges smooshed down we can just pop the center out and if you want to save this, just stick it back down on the uh, paper. And you can use this square of double-sided adhesive for whatever the heck you want, because it's not needed for this anymore. And, ooh, one of my concerns, and maybe we'll be fine. Test fit. Make sure there's no weird alignment. Okay, so my concern was that the adhesive, since it was going past the shell, it might be showing under the lens, but that is not the case because the lens has quite a bit of overlap. So I didn't need to trim nearly as much as I did, but I'm glad I did anyway. Alright. I guess I'll do the lens. for the LCD. Peel the protective film off. And then for alignment, again, we are going for that top wall. And that should be it. And you can save this. This this film is actually pretty useful for like picking up fingerprints off screens and getting them clean. Um, they sell like LCD de-dusting tape. That's exactly what this stuff is. But look at that. metal surface on the back of the screen. Technically, that's not metal. I mean, the, the bottom part where it's copper colored, that's copper. But this little reflective area is actually plastic. Not that it matters. Actually, that looks, that looks fine. Now the hard part is we have to connect the board up to the LCD. It's much easier to do this when it's not in the shell, but we need to hold it up at a 90-ish degree angle, get the connector aligned, and then put it on. Do not want to put the board on like this, and then try, like, getting the, um, you know, smooshing the connector down because it will flex the LCD and it can damage it. 
it being the uh, LCD, of course. That drops in just like that. And I'm going to run that to the other side of the port for aesthetic purposes. So this might seem like common sense to uh, some of you, but it's n it's apparently not. Um, I guess I've, I've learned this through years of experience and just kind of do it without even thinking about it. But when you're threading screws into plastic, like you don't need to really crank them down. Like they just need to be snug. That's it. You don't want to... don't want to go too hard otherwise you'll crack the screw post uh, what am I missing I'm missing the shielding I should have a bag full of parts I said I should have a bag full of there it is those were the wrong buttons and the wrong screws for that matter that's okay We'll make it work anyhow. It's probably exactly how that other set of buttons came about. six seven long ones which means we use these short ones for the shielding easy these aftermarket shells do actually use different screws for the shielding so it's kind of important to uh, pay attention to that uh, different compared to OEM uh, I, I know the thread pitch is different. I don't know if the diameter of the screw itself is different. I'm betting it's just the thread pitch that's different. Which means you can't mix and match the screws, but for the first time you can send whatever the heck you want and you should be good. Maybe. Usually they click. I guess it's not going to click this time. Oh, I see the problem. This tab is supposed to be back out the back, not out the front. Ta-da! Click. And what do we have left? Just the power switch. I'll we'll use the OEM one for nice clean fitment. Oh, I forgot to put the insulation film on the PCB. Uh, I think I'm going to risk freeballing it because those wires should provide quite a bit of cushion. Um, I definitely recommend using the film though. I mean, it's like I said, it's included for a reason. Generally, when they include something, you know, they're not they're not paying for it out of the goodness of your, of their heart. 
Well, I guess you are paying for it. Anyway, what am I looking for? I'm looking for something that's still sticking in my original shell. A little dirty. Now, not that IR is particularly important to me, but the replacement window that the shell comes with is not IR transparent. So if you use that, you will not have working IR. I'm going to do something a little tricky with these touch sensors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick them onto the back here so that we can use them when there's no game in the system. But when there's a game in the system, I want them to be pretty much locked out. Uh, unfortunately, they're a little on the short side, but we'll make it work. And get this adhesive off. Or the uh, paper backing, rather. just stick that onto the back and uh, go for the best. Because this is a transparent shell, I'm going to put a little bit more effort into making them aligned. Not that much effort, mind you, but some. Doesn't quite fit together as smoothly as I'd hoped, but Oh well, I'm sure it's fine. usual method for tightening screws is I uh, get it all the way down to where it's nice and finger tight and back off an eighth of a turn. I have yet to crack a screw post doing that. And believe me, I've cracked screw posts before. I'm speaking from experience. All set. It's all done. It's it's gonna just work, right? Let's find out on next week's episode of Dragon Ball Z. I'm kidding. I just wanted to take a quick break. Um, let's get some batteries in here, and hey, it is where it 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 do work. Uh, is this the battery sensor? Yes, it is. Excellent. So the OSD is pulled up by hitting A, B, and select. 
and you navigate it by hitting B and A and then select is going to be uh, like the confirm button. I'm going to go ahead and kill my desk lighting here so you can see this just a little bit better. Um, we can adjust the brightness from here. Come on. Maybe? There we go. Select and A to get into that. We step through. Select an A to confirm. We can adjust the position. Curious how far down that goes. Yeah, there you go. Now you can see it under the uh, logo too. Actually, hang on. Oops. I meant to leave that. Select an A to confirm. Alright, so what I want to see now is if holding both of these does a factory reset. That's what I was seeing before. And indeed, that's exactly what that is. Okay, cool. So, if you're sitting here going, I don't even know what that means, um, let's go over that. So what that does is that does that exact same thing as that menu option. Uh, what that means is, ah, in color adjust. So there are some circumstances with the older version of the kit, not this specific one, at least not that I've seen, uh, where you can um, corrupt the color storage values or color display values. And when corrupt, this is exactly what the console looks like. You just get a black screen. And so if you don't have, I mean, if you have the OSD, it's just a matter of going in here and hitting factory mode reset. But if you don't have the OSD and all you have are the touch sensors, you just press and hold both of those, wait for it to reset, and you've got your display back. That's important because, uh, like I said, some of the other older kits did manage to corrupt pretty easily. And uh, one of the reasons, one of the most common things that I've seen that causes that corruption, pull that off, I don't even know why I stole that on there, is uh, like, let's say, let's say you have your touch sensor right by the power switch. Every time you hit the power switch, you might trigger the touch sensor. If you change a setting and the kit is saving those settings on board, and you switch it off before it completes saving, that data is going to be corrupt. Uh, in a lot of the other kits, that doesn't seem to matter because if, it de if they detect corrupt data, they just reset on their own. But for some reason, for whatever reason, this kit was just never programmed to do that. Now, again, I have no idea if this iteration of the kit has been updated to fix that bug, but if not, we have a manual workaround and it's I'm actually really pleased. They they did good with that. Um, let me... The alignment is... Oh, so close. I almost had it. Let me get that dialed in real quick. So mine is at 21 and 39. So we have the normal pixel mode, which is no pixel grid emulation. We have the retro pixel grid mode, which is uh, it is one line vertical and one line horizontal for every four pixels. So this kit works by using integer scaling at a 4x multiplier. Uh, so what that means is every original Game Boy pixel is represented by a grid of 4x4, four four, which is 16 pixels. This screen is ex absurdly high resolution compared to the original Game Boy. So the original, or so this pixel effect, the retro pixel mode, that is changing that to a 3x3 three three grid with an added line. We can change it to interlaced, which looks like it just adds vertical lines, 
instead of vertical and horizontal in a three by four grid. Uh, we have interlaced two, which looks like, to the naked eye, it looks like uh, a two by four grid instead of a three by four grid. And then interlaced three, no, that's going to be the 2x4. I don't know what interlaced 2 is, but it appears somewhat darker than interla interlaced 1. I'll have to put those under a microscope and find out. Uh, battery display. Uh, looks like the labels are backwards, so that's cool. Oh, wait, no. That's weird. Now it's normal. I'll leave that off. The logo color we can set to whatever color we want. I'm genuinely surprised they don't have a uh, like color picker for that. Oh, you can disable it. That's nice. And there are 32 colors. Is that what I saw? Yeah. Hmm. I like 23 for this shell. And then reset, and that's it. There are no other options in there. Uh, I am going to take some flash cards here, and we are going to run the 144P test suite. Oh, my battery display is on, and I want it off. All right, so I can see if I pull up the grid, you can see I got the screen alignment pretty good. I mean, it, it'll hide the edges if I tilt the screen, but that's because this is not, the glass is not laminated to the LCD itself. There is a bit of an air gap. So depending on the viewing angle, I might have something cut off. But for me, looking at it normally, it looks perfectly fine. And I see it from this angle. And now, me looking at the actual Game Boy and not through the screen, it's, it's cut off. So you guys just see a different angle than I do. It looks good to me. Linearity, uh, this test, we just want to make sure that that circle is actually a circle. And indeed it is a uh, circle. Uh, I honestly don't know what this, te this test is supposed to do. I think we can use these to adjust CRT's color convergence. I don't think that's relevant here. Uh, also, for some reason, this test toggles the color palettes in the kit. How weird is that? That is one argument for removing the touch sensors, especially if you've got everything hardwired like I do. There we go. Shadow Sprite. So this is the interesting one. So for this test, I'm usually running uh, Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, and I'm talking about uh, that guy's chain, and uh, here's that spiel again. So what's going on is the original Game Boy console did not have a way to achieve transparency with the sprites, uh, and the screens also had a really terrible pixel response time, so one workaround most devs came up with was just strobe the, strobe the sprite, and because of the horrifying pixel response, it'll look transparent. Now, personally, I can see that that is flickering quite a bit. Uh, one of the things we're testing for, uh, this screen does have quite a bit better pixel response, so you can actually see that flickering. Uh, but one of the things we're testing for is to see if there's any weird image retention, because on some of the kits, uh, if you leave a flickering object in one place long enough, the uh, pixel response time starts slowing down a little bit. Uh, maybe to compensate for that artifact, Maybe something else. I honestly don't know enough about these things to, to speculate. Uh, but that results in, if we have that flickering object and then move it, 
sometimes we'll see a flickering object where it was and we'll still see the new flickering object. Fortunately, this screen is A-OK -okay and doesn't seem to have that problem. That is behaving exactly like I would expect. Uh, that was Shadow Sprite. Vertical scroll, grid. Oh, see, that one's toggling the color palettes now, too. That's annoying. And I can't do much else with the rest of this stuff. Cool. So, remember that pixel... Ooh, that didn't insert properly for some reason. And now it's jammed. That happens to me every now and then with carts, and I I don't know what it is. Because now it went in fine. Anyway. So on this flash cart, I have a game called Zass. And personally, I don't care for this game, but it is a very excellent demonstration of why the um, that shadow sprite test of the flickering objects is important. Uh, so if we try and play this game on this screen, you can see all that flickering in the background. It looks horrible. I'd call it, I'd call it darn near unplayable. Unfortunately, this is just kind of how these games end up. Um, now, I'm looking at the preview on my screen, and uh, the preview on my phone that I'm recording this from does look perfectly fine, but I assure you in person, it is flickering like crazy. Um, if we want to be pedantic, it is perfectly playable, but it's not a pleasant experience. For context, if I power this off and take a perfectly stock AGS 101 console and play the exact same game, these consoles are known for their horrifying pixel response time. Uh, they're actually pretty similar to original Game Boys in that matter, in that regard. And looking at this specific game, I wonder if that was intentional. But anyway, we could start this up. This isn't an aftermarket screen. It's original o OEM, AGS 101. If you look close, you can still see the flickering, but it is very subtle. So this is the ideal way that this game should look, more or less, uh, with very little flickering, nice and playable. If I were to show this on the original Game Boy Color screen, if I could even capture that on camera, you'd see pretty similar effect. Uh, there is still a little bit of flickering, but it is, like, you have to look for it to find it, whereas on this console, it was extremely obvious. Uh, but that's the screen. Let's talk about the, uh, elephant in the room, as it were. So this kit, the I guess the whole reason for one of these... Oh! I uh, just threw the flash card I was about to plug in. There we go. The whole reason for this kit is if I can get it. The HDMI out. And if we plug that in, it should just switch over automatically. And indeed it does. How convenient. Uh, so I guess I will just run around Pokemon Silver for a wee bit. I've got the volume up and oh, that is, that's interesting. I don't seem to be getting any audio over HDMI. Let me double check it's not my capture. There it is. Alright, it worked for a second. No idea what it is.
Oh, that's desktop audio. Whoops. Wah. Audio input capture. Hey. User error. Disregard. All right. So we've still got our OSD. Can we continue, mayhaps? Oh, what? This is a new game. That ain't right. <laughs> you can hear that wonderful sync lag. And to be clear, that's not the kit. That's just my capture card. It's um, not great. So one thing I might consider a weird idiosyncrasy is that the audio is still tied to this volume wheel, which means we have audio coming out the speaker and the TV, and I can't control the volume for one independently. I, I control the volume for both. There's only one volume control for sound on the Game Boy Color, and muting the speaker also mutes the uh, audio on the uh, capture. Sounds like I only have one channel on the capture now. I'm going to attribute that to user error. Since I thought it was working, but I, I was clearly wrong on that. Anyway, let's look at the OSD and see what we have. I am going to turn that down so that I don't feel like I have to speak over it. Uh, we have battery display on and off. It's actually something you might want to consider keeping on for the uh, TV out mode, just because you're probably not looking at the battery indicator built into the Game Boy. Um, I mean, you still have to physically play the Game Boy, but you're looking at your TV at the very least. Uh, and actually, let's see, does that save? Ah, uh, that's persistent. That's unfortunate. It is what it is. Uh, we also have TV mode. So let's see what TV modes we have. We have mode 1, which looks like the default, and it looks like the proper aspect ratio. Mode 2, which looks like the exact same thing. And mode 3, which... I have no idea what these settings do. They all look the same to me. Alright, so I have no idea what that does. Color adjust, we can use the same palettes, and then factory reset. So fewer options. Uh, it makes sense that the uh, screen position adjustment isn't available. Um, there just doesn't, I mean, it's HDMI, you know, they're, <laughs> they're not gonna get that wrong. Um, he says as they've gotten it wrong several times previously. Uh, no, what I mean is the position is always gonna be pretty spot on. Previously, uh, something they've done, they've gotten the um, aspect ratio totally wrong. Oops. I did not want to save state. I'm wondering if my touch sensors are just like too close to the edge. Uh, I want 240p test suite. I don't know where it is on my flashcard, but it's on this cart. So we'll just do that. So the specific thing I wanted to look at are the uh, grid and the um, linearity. So the grid you can see absolutely nothing is cut off. It's spot on. Linearity, that is indeed a circle, at least on my screen, but I'm looking at a 16 by 9 screen and looks like a 16 by 9 capture and it is properly pillar boxed and letter boxed so that we have both integer scaling and a um, the actual proper aspect ratio. So I am very pleased with that. Oh. That's so weird that this test toggles the palettes. I wonder what specific thing about this test does that. That's just nuts to me. Anyway, 
Uh, and there was one more. I wanted to look at this stripes to, oh. So this thing clearly doesn't like that stripes test, but the reason I wanted to pull this up is because uh, I made an incorrect assumption. And I'm eating crow right now, but what I'm looking at here is I can see that there's no integer scaling. What? That must be the difference between mode. Oh, I never applied it. That's my bad. So interestingly enough, we do get a, um, integer scale with that applied on mode three, even though it's the wrong aspect ratio. And by integer scale, I mean the vertical and horizontal aren't scaled by the same integer, but at the very least it does look to be an integer nonetheless. Uh, that is something I can correct in post. I won't, but I can. Interesting. Okay. I'll leave it on mode one. Because even though I now see it's not integer scaling, it is still the best looking, I think, because it is the only one with the proper aspect ratio. Ah, oh, that's such a shame, man. They got it so close. I'll have to plug this thing into other sources and see if they did better elsewhere. I doubt they did, but uh, it's so close. It's so close, man. Um, it's quite a bit of work to get this installed. I don't know how I feel about it. I'm just going to quickly run through the color options. Keep in mind that I don't have the best capture card. There's quite a lot of compression on it. Plus I'm recording in a lossy format uh, with some pretty significant compression because I know my capture card's not gonna do this game any favors anyhow. Uh, oh, let us try one more thing. Let's try this on the capture. I almost wonder, ooh, that is horrifying. So that is pretty much worst case scenario. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what's up with that. I can't explain that one away. For context, I'm actually gonna power this off and, and uh, switch back to the overhead here. Uh, I yeah, I can dump that off. Got an analog pocket here. Drop that game in. And if we uh, try playing that on here, You can see quite a bit of flickering, yeah? Still showing that exact same flickering, but the analog pocket, oh, I can just do it while pause, that's even more convenient. Uh, the analog pocket has a really, really nice feature, GB, that I haven't seen on other, anything else yet, uh, frame blending. We turn that on and flicker be gone. Huh? Huh? That is pretty much ideal.
Ironically, this actually runs better on this console than it does on the Game Boy Advance SP, the AGS-101. I'm going to stop playing this because I can hardly talk and play at the same time. Because um, even though the pixel response on this LCD is phenomenal, uh, that frame blending mode gives us quite a bit to work with. And uh, I'd actually like to see that on some other kits. Uh, not mandatory, of course. I would like it optional, but... You know, nice to have. Uh, I think that's all I've got. Um, actually, no, I lied. I've got a couple more things. I never actually finished this install. So I am going to pull this thing apart and swap out these buttons at some point because this B button gets stuck randomly. And of course, now it's working perfectly fine. Uh, I wanted I wanted better buttons anyway. So I'll get, I'll get better buttons, just... I don't have them yet because of who I am as a person. I keep I keep neglecting to order them. I go to order buttons and I go, oh wait, no, I have a ton of buttons. And it's like, yeah, I do have a ton of Game Boy Advance buttons. <laughs> oh, that one's empty. There's one more. You can hear it. I'm not gonna pull it out. You get the point. Um, I keep ordering Game Boy Advance buttons thinking I need them, and I really don't. And I keep not ordering Game Boy Color buttons except for, like, clear for backlight kits. Uh, like, button backlight kits. And it's not working out for me. But that's a me problem, and I'll work that out. The last thing I wanted to talk about was the, uh, was the label. You know, we gotta, we gotta finish off the build, right? So I've actually got quite a few options here. So I rated RGRS and got pretty much one of every label, and in some cases, several. These Game Boy Advance ones are actually print samples, same with the uh, Pokemon Center ones. Uh, so I have, I have quite a few samples. They are a little bit different than the retail ones, at least that's my understanding. Um, but the only difference might just be that they were... Um, printed separately, but this isn't a Game Boy Advance, so it doesn't matter. But we've got plenty of options. I can use the uh, hollow labels. I grabbed some of those, he says as he pulls out yet more Game Boy Advance logos, labels. I think this bag might just be solely Game Boy Advance, but we've got these neat hollow labels from RGRS that I thought would be totally kick-ass with this shell. And the single only reason I'm not using them is because I want to use the new labels that I just commissioned from uh, Next Stop, Please. Because when else am I going to get to use them? But you can grab these like Pokemon Center labels and they fit perfectly in the battery compartment sticker cutout. I clearly got more than my fair share. I think the Game Boy Color ones are actually in this bag. Whatever. It doesn't matter. There's examples. I'll link them below. RGRS has a lot of neat stuff. And I'm not just saying that because he sent me this kit. I'm saying that because he has a lot of neat stuff. Uh, that's MGB. I want the color one. Disgusting. Oh, there we go. Alright. This is probably not the best shell for this, but we're going to try it anyway. Ooh, and static is really trying to screw me over. Oh, that is far from perfect.
but a few minutes working that in, I think I can work out some of the blemishes. But, huh? Huh? Pretty neat, right? Can't even see it. <laughs> Whatever. I thought they were neat. Uh, these transparent stickers probably look heaps better on um, opaque shells. Like that. But... Whatever. I wanted to use my new labels anyhow. What the heck? There we go. Ah, that's a little off center. Good enough. Fun fact, the Game Boy Color came out in 1998, October 21st. Neat. Anyway, I think that's all I've got. So, I guess let's, uh, let's discuss my feelings on this kit. Uh, I mean, obviously I've only had an hour and a half of experience with this thing. I mean, technically at this point, like 10 minutes, because that's how long I've had this thing assembled. Um, so if there's any weird idiosyncrasies that are to be discovered after actually playing the thing for a long time, I've yet to discover them. And quite frankly, I probably, probably won't get that far because I have, for playing Game Boy Color, a consoleizer kit. I have the GBHD Color, and that is basically the same thing. You insert Game Boy Color cart, and it outputs HDMI. The difference here is the external controller is quite a bit more comfy than the actual Game Boy Color. Uh, and this doesn't run on batteries. You just plug it in and it's good to go. This one you have to pay attention to batteries still. So it's, it's kind of an awkward like hybrid type device. That is an impressive panel gap. I think I need to check my trim. I just realized the, uh, like if you look at the separation between the front and back of the shell, anywhere else it's nice and thin, but right up here it is stupid thick. So I think I got my trim wrong. I need to, I need to pull this apart and do a little bit more trimming. Um, sorry. Oh, look, a chicken. Uh, as far as, like, an actual HDMI experience goes, this thing is way better. Uh, but obviously this thing sucks as a portable, um, given that it has no screen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, you could battery-power it if you want, and then get, like, a um, battery-powered HDMI display and hook that up. Totally work. You could run that thing off a power bank, no problem. Uh, I don't know. It's it's a bit of a compromise. I, I think I need to think on it a little bit more and figure out exactly what I want to say. I have mixed feelings. Most of these kits, you know, I know right away, like, oh yeah, this is this is a banger, or oh no, this is this is total garbage. But this one I'm I'm having real mixed feelings on. It's difficult to install, and it is kind of pricey compared to all of the other backlight kits for Game Boy Color. But, unlike all of the other backlight kits for Game Boy Color, this does HDMI out. Um, the other backlight kits, some of them do VGA, like the original McWill mod. Um, there's also another, basically another iteration of this kit that does... I just figured out why it's why that test was causing the color palettes to flicker because the sensor is quite literally touching the LCD data line so I need to pull this apart and move that one. I'm thinking I'm going to put that one down here at the bottom and then this one all the way up at the top and just have them vertically stacked or nah that's what I'm doing vertically stacked but I'm going to pull it apart and I'm going to do that off camera because it's boring and this video is already way too long. Um, 
yeah, it does HDMI. The HDMI output does seem pretty good. I was able to trigger some glitches with synthetic tests. Uh, I would like to remind you that those are synthetic tests and they are designed to break things. Most games, you will not experience that. I am sure somewhere there's at least one game that will break in the same way that I was able to break it with my synthetic tests. Uh, you saw when I had that uh, screen line ROM on, the um, mode was switching on its own. And I thought that was, that was a little weird, but sure. Maybe that was a glitch being triggered by uh, hitting these touch sensors in a specific combination, or maybe the kit just breaks when you try and display something like that. I don't know. I'll have to play with it some more. But it's all right. I mean, obviously, this is a very specific niche. niche. So, you know, if, if this is what you're into, you know, Game Boy Color is one of your favorite Game Boy consoles, then sure, by all means. Uh, for what it's worth, though, I think the uh, Game Boy Advance iteration of this kit, I think it's worth considering. Um, it is... It was a lot easier to do than the Game Boy Color version, uh, especially the trimming. But uh, one specific thing about the Game Boy Advance iteration is that it plays Game Boy Color games. And it plays Game Boy Advance games. So, I don't know. Um, the console itself is a little bit more comfortable to hold. Uh, feels a little bit more like a gaming controller, but if you don't ever want to play Game Boy Advance games, then I guess it doesn't make sense to get Game Boy Advance, but just saying, bang for buck, the Game Boy Advance version seems a little bit more intriguing, especially because this is just an interposer. Uh, it sits between the actual backlight kit and the Game Boy Advance console, so the HDMI out portion is a little bit cheaper, and you can install it in a console that already has an IPS kit, Assuming you have one of the specific IPS kits that's compatible because some of them are a little bit too thick. You get, you get, um, there's not a lot of room in there for this thing and an IPS kit. So some of them work, some of them don't, but it is what it is. Ah, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's weird. There's also fewer settings, so you're kind of stuck with what you get. And quite frankly, I don't remember what the aspect ratio looked like on that, on this thing. Um, I suppose it wouldn't be too difficult to test and find out, but that's not really the point of this video. Uh, if you want to see the Game Boy Advance version of this kit, I will have that linked in the description as well. Um, shut up. But just quick preview. And yeah, this one wasn't the correct aspect ratio either, but it's closer. And I think, I think that's good enough. Um, this one was the correct aspect ratio for Game Boy Color. And it's, it's close. Obviously, it's not great. Uh, I don't know if I ever tested this. You can see nothing's cut off at the very least. Uh, Shadow Sprite and all that should perform the same. One interesting thing, I suppose... Oh, shoot, what was it? It was one of the lines. Full screen stripes, is that it? Yeah, you can see this one is running at a much lower resolution. It does not look as good. So for Game Boy Color, yeah, I take it back. Totally take it back. If you want to play Game Boy Color specifically, this is definitely a better way to go than this thing. I don't know what it is. I don't know why why it's so different. Maybe they'll make an updated version of this one. Yet another new kit. Um, hmm. Mixed feelings. If you want it, it's an option. It works, it's pretty good. Just pay attention to your touch sensors. Um, but if you're not if you're not absolutely sure that you want HDMI out on your Game Boy Color, then uh, there are better kits that are easier to install. Uh, like 
for example, the ones I showed off when I did these other shell mods. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got. Uh, that is not. This one specifically is the one I wanted to reference when I said other kits. Um, but yeah, description. Check it out. There's some neat stuff. Uh, especially my wiki on all the other backlight kits. Good lord, this is a long video. Alright, that's all I got. I'll catch you all next time. Thanks for sticking with me. I, I know it was a long one. Uh, but like I said, this was a harder kit to install than most. Lots of trimming, lots of back and forth. For context, it is 10.40 p.m. and I have been working on this since 7.30 p.m. Even though the video itself is only going to be about two hours, probably less. There's a lot more work into it than that because of how much trimming I had to do. Uh, but I don't think I need to add anything else. If I think of something, it'll be in the uh, wiki that I've linked in the description. I'll create a new line item for this kit and uh, we'll go from there. There you go. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you all next time.